Meet Ija, a two-hectare forest born in 2013 in northwest Spain, where productive and unproductive nature thrives. A wild place where over 400 species mingle and dance. Bushes, roots, medicinals, vegetables, climbers, and trees all coexist and create something much larger than their parts, a kind of temperate jungle. It is a place where wild nature finds a home, and though we're noticing stronger populations of wild animals every year, with plenty of birds, insects, and lizards, the only mammals over the size of a hedgehog who've taken up residence so far are us. We're Ija's best friends and kind of her parents. This is me, Diego, forest designer, weirdo, and friend to nature. And this is Bosque, my brother. Forest not, game master, and probably also a weirdo, depending on who you ask. Lots of people ask us about Ija's design, so we wanted to make a video that explores it a bit. But that means starting with the unfortunate truth that there isn't really a single design we can point to. Of course, we've made maps and drawings and had plenty of conversations about structure and where things go, but there's so much we didn't know when we started that each has gone through too many changes to track while we learned along the way. So at this point, it's like trying to explain a person's life in 20 minutes. Every month lets us discover a brand new forest, and every month the design needs updating. So in light of that, what we can do is go over different parts of Ija and explore her history. And that hopefully might give you a sense of who we thought she'd be, who she is, and who we hope she may become. First, a bit of history. The earliest information we have about the land was that it was a cow pasture for at least a few generations. Then, about 30 years ago, sheep pasture. All the while having some parts planted with corn and potatoes, and others planted as a vineyard. As far back as anyone can remember, the land's been a mosaic of monocultures that have plowed and eroded the land, actively worked to prevent natural biodiversity from springing up, weakened the soil through extractive farming, waged war against microscopic life, and then tried to control all the problems resulting from that treatment through the use of straight manure, sulfates, and occasionally chemical pesticides. Basically, if nature ever expressed herself in the slightest, there was always someone ready to ensure that that wouldn't happen. Then, ten years ago, that changed. My brother came to the rescue. He left America and reclaimed the family land. And a little over a year later, seeing my brother doing something pretty awesome, I joined him. Our first design was thought up to be a place where we could retreat from the world. We thought that if we could grow everything we needed and be completely self-sufficient, we wouldn't have to deal with civilization anymore. That we could just drop out. And the first design reflects that thinking. It was drawn up as an exercise in a permaculture design course and was pretty simplistic. It didn't really understand the land, the importance of building relationships, or our own mental health in trying to maintain it. If we're being honest, all we really understood at that point was that we wanted something more respectful of the way nature works. And around these parts, if you disappear for a generation, when you get back, there's a forest there. So more or less, we thought, yeah, that. Eventually, though, we started realizing that self-sufficiency is completely possible if you ignore your body and just push yourself endlessly. It was a design that thought we could brute force ecology through tireless work and set us up for burnout. But not realizing that, we pushed on. So in 2013, 
The soil was plowed for the last time. We made swales and sowed cover crops. And that was the last time any machines were brought on the land, and everything more or less has been done by hand since. At the end of 2013, on most swale lines, we planted as many trees as we could to start filling in the space. Starting on contour, planting primarily hazelnuts, peaches, and native nitrogen fixers. Every seven meters there was a tree, and at first it seemed like a lot, but if we could start over, we'd probably have planted ten times as many and then thinned them back, which is what we ended up doing. So over the past decade we've planted hundreds of new trees and bushes, continuing until today, where it's hard to find any space for new trees. In a nutshell, that brings us up to date, where through our management and the different ecological behaviors of the land, a few different centers have popped up which we'll cover one by one. The first center is my favorite place, probably in the world. The forest garden is a super biodiverse open forest where the trees are spread far enough apart that there's plenty of light for everything to thrive. The result is a space with many different niches and shapes where any plant could presumably find a place to thrive. And because it takes advantage of all those little spaces, it produces more than any other kind of temperate ecosystem with food in every direction. There's food in the shade, in full sun, there's food in March, August, December, in the ground, in the sky, there's vegetables, aromatics, medicinals, plenty of berries, but also fruit and nuts, with everything from apples to pawpaws, hazelnuts to Japanese walnuts, acabia to kiwis, garlic chives to hyssop. They all find their place, which is what makes this a deeply enjoyable ecosystem to weed, plant, or just sit around in for an afternoon. Then there's a place for agroforestry, which is a forested space more thought out for production, with long lines of productive trees planted to efficiently take advantage of sunlight and designed for ease of harvest. But over time, since we've filled it in with more nitrogen fixers and other trees with the idea to prune them down and build up the soil, it quickly became a place with all sorts of little corners and pockets that make it way more of an adventure than anything else. And though some parts are more open, others are closed, and in summer when the leaves and undergrowth come in, it's easy to get lost and turned around, and have to reorient yourself a few times to remember where you're even going. The skeleton of the section are rows of hazelnut and peach, planted about every seven meters. And though our original design had called for corridors between these rows to be somewhere we might plant annual crops like oats, potatoes, or yakon, over time we've learned to embrace the forest. And we made a conscious choice based on wanting a bit of a slower lifestyle to make a move towards perennials and not incorporate that space for annuals. So now it's filled with all sorts of currants, raspberries, loganberries, autumn olive, native perennials and native nitrogen fixers, blueberries, and plenty of pasture for geese. Then, there's a small space that's inspired by syntropic agriculture. Syntropic methods are basically overplanting way more than you'd expect, and then strategically pruning and cutting everything back. This accelerates ecologic succession and builds soil. It's very similar to the Miyawaki method as well, if you're more familiar with that, in that they both rely on competition to accelerate growth. It's so dense, it's quite hard to get a good shot of it, but the day-to-day -day of watching this forest has been exhilarating. Every few square meters we've planted hazelnuts, a fruit tree like a plum, pear, or apple, as well as alders, elderberries, and mulberries and together we've seen them all grow to establish a forest quicker than anything else we've tried. It's remarkable how 
while the space has sprung to life in such a relatively short period of time, considering we planted it at the beginning of 2016. There's also natural reforestation happening, where we've done little except sneak in a few species we like, while the majority of the work was voluntarily done by nature. This includes a swampy area where willows are establishing an interesting native forest around which we may eventually construct a few ponds for aquaculture, a place where hundreds of black locusts have sprouted up from the roots of a single fallen tree, and a labyrinth carved out of the overpowering amount of blackberry that grow on the land. Within all that, we've planted a few spaces with walnuts, alders, persimmons, and a hedge to add biodiversity. Overall, we haven't done much, and the results are amazing. With very little work, there's a forest that will eventually produce plenty of food, currently produces plenty of high-quality lumber for garden projects, and, like the rest of the forest, is a pleasure to stroll. Finally, at the far end of the land is a native forest 30 years into its life. Remember before when I mentioned what happens if you leave something alone for a generation? Well, before I was born, my grandfather got sick and wasn't able to bring the cows down to pasture. And this is the result of those years of natural growth. This is a place where we've done absolutely nothing. Here you'll find some of the best soil around and one of the few places I've ever found in our region where you can actually see the natural shapes of a forest. With a canopy of native alder and willow, laurels and elderberry acting as an understory, plenty of smaller bushes, herbaceous plants and ground covers, as well as a few oaks that will one day become giants. Super interesting about this place is the boundary with the neighbor, and I would like to be able to show you the great natural diversity that grows there, as all sorts of native plants that don't grow anywhere else thrive on the shady woodland edge, but I can't. Since it's technically a public path, despite literally nobody except for us actually using it, our neighbors routinely cut it back because it bothers them, and I'm pretty salty about it, so I won't go too far into it. Basically, what we've learned is that letting a forest express herself is like raising a kid. Over time, you learn about new interests and skills, and you learn their personality, their likes and dislikes. And since Ija's personality is still developing, and since I can count the forest gardens in our region on one hand, we're still trying to figure out what works best in this particular corner of the world. So of course, we're making plenty of mistakes along the way. What's clear is that Ija has taught us so much. With all her variety of zones and spaces, all the different species intermingling, and having allowed Ija to really express herself has been such a beautiful experience. As we've learned about behavior of dry spots and swampy spots and uh, forested spots, good soil, bad soil, and not only have we learned a lot about how nature functions, what works and what doesn't, We've learned about people, and myself as well. In practicing listening to nature, to figure out what she needs, I've become a bit better at listening to myself and to everyone I meet. And despite failing at it all the time, I do want to discover what it's like to let things be what they are and take the time they need to develop instead of impatiently trying to mold them to my way of thinking or pushing my own opinions. And it's in that vein of thinking that we're discovering two paths for the future. The first path is ecological. Ija is an isolated island. In our eyes, she's an important ecosystem, but one where the benefits are limited to the artificial boundaries of our property lines. She's not large enough to protect a badger or a deer whose populations are worryingly low in our region because even if they were raised on our land at only two hectares, eventually they would wander out onto the road or neighboring hunting grounds or the native woods where there's not much to eat. And it's hard to find places where their life would not be in danger. 
which is why we're dreaming of Ilya becoming a mother forest, a place where the species and plants, lessons and understanding are reproduced and expanded, where we take part in a feedback wave of ever-expanding life, where the ripples and effects of these diverse regenerative forests become the standard, and we can help these islands spread not only to neighboring lands, but throughout the region. For just a bit of context, we're surrounded by monocultures that not only destroy the landscape and dry it out, but definitely do not live up to the potential of what the land could produce. Keep in mind that there's really no difference between our land and our neighbor's land other than the care and attention we've each put into it. What we're seeing is the land's potential, a place that shows us that people can be a force of good on the landscape. We'd love to see her expand into an ecological park or a natural reserve where several people can collaborate by protecting or creating their own patches of living forest. And then the challenge would become the creation of regenerative green corridors between them. The second path we see is human. Eventually, I think Nidia will become a forest where people can go to see the potential of nature and re-examine their own place in it place where we don't really ask the question, is this sustainable? But instead we start asking, what are we trying to sustain? That is, what parts of our life and culture would we actually like to survive? And I think she'll be a place where people can explore those questions through living games that explore our connections to ecology and culture. And I suspect that through those games, we'll find that Ida is substantially more than just a place to produce food. She's a wild and sacred place, where the needs, wants, and desires of people and plants merge into something profoundly new. A place where nature finds a home, where we relearn how to find balance, and in that way realize something that's always been true, that the future of the forest is tied to our own future, and that our well-being is irrevocably tied to the well-being of the land.